Hello and welcome back to PEX Live Process Mining 2022. If you have just joined us, this webinar is delivered to you live so you can interact with our speakers through live questions and polls and you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Each session will have fresh new content in the resource box provided by our speakers and sponsors. Don't forget to download these digital giveaways. Now, may I introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Marlon Dumas, who is a co-founder and head of strategic initiatives at Apremor. Marilyn has been in love with process mining since 2008 and would like to share his knowledge with you in this session titled From Process Mining to Augmented Business Process Management, Trends and Early Success Stories. Now over to you, Marlon. Hi, thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to kind of try to um, trans give to you some overview of where we are heading uh, from process mining onwards in terms of developing new opportunities for continuous improvement in organizations. Um, I, I am Marlon Dumas, I am co-founder at Apromore, and, uh, uh, but I'm going to try here not to make any type of sales talk, to just talk about how process mining is helping organizations and how the next generation of process mining systems, which are called augmented BPM systems, are going to go even further in this direction. To illustrate what I'm going to say during this presentation, I'll take a character, which is a real life character. I just slightly changed the name, uh, Tom. Uh, Tom is operation excellence manager at a manufacturing company. Um, I met him about five to six years ago. Um, and he inspired me in terms of the journey that we have had so far. Uh, Tom cares about customers, about sales, of course, and revenue, about operational effic efficiency and operations margins. Um, every week, sometimes even every day, Tom has different questions. Um, why do we have production delays in a given production plant? Why has the number of product returns for a certain category of products been rising lately? Which orders are delivered late and how can we avoid it? You know, is it happening for certain types of products? Is it happening for certain types of customers, for certain types of regions, and so on? And beyond that, Tom, in addition to knowing what are the issues in the process, Tom wants to know how he can improve his processes. How can he reduce delivery delay by 10%? It's a typical question that he might have for a particular category of products. There is a possibility of perhaps investing into automation, in particular RPA. If so, which, which tasks in the process should I be targeting? with this technology? Should I add more resources or redeploy resources from one part of the process to another? Should I reduce the size of the batches because they have batching in these manufacturing lines and, and you know, it's wondering if maybe smaller batch sizes will allow uh, the company to achieve their service level agreements better? Uh, or what else? What else can I do? That's the questions that Tom is having. Um, Tom's company, Tom is on the business side, and Tom's company has actually heaps of data from different systems. Uh, requests for quotes from customers, the corresponding quotes, uh, orders with all their tracking information from receipt to fulfillment, um, work orders in the production side, shipments, product returns, customer complaints, you name it. So there is actually tons of data out there, and there are data stewards in there taking care of that, and there is a whole business, uh, business intelligence infrastructure. There's everything uh, Tom will want. Yet, Tom is having troubles finding answers to such simple questions as the one uh, I show, uh, the ones I showed before. It's in that context that Tom's organization adopted process mining a few years back. Uh, 
what I will call first for descriptive process analytics purposes. So what, what process mining in this context does is that it goes and taps into those systems where the data is sitting about the, the orders, about the quotes, etc., And it brings it together into a tool that then allows Tom's and his team, because there's a whole team behind, to discover the process, the steps in the process, process models, process maps, you know, you, you've seen them. To enhance those process models with performance information, to build performance dashboards to complement those, those models in order to have insights both from the perspective of performance measurement and from the perspective of step-by-step -step execution of the process. Um, to generate uh, reports of conformance with respect to certain uh, business rules that you know need to be fulfilled during the performance of the process. This is food manufacturing. There are certain reports that need to be uh, uh, generated, certain pathways that need to be followed. And to generate comparisons, what I would call variant analysis, or if you wish, comparative process mining, to compare how different production plants are performing, how the company is performing with respect to different types of customers, different types of orders, uh, identifying, analyzing potential root causes by combining uh, techniques from Six Sigma, in particular uh, root cause analysis techniques with process mining in order to walk back from the issues in the process to their potential root causes. So this is where Tom managed to get with his team after, let's say, three, three, six months and then onwards kept going in this trajectory. This is what I will call descriptive process mining. It's a, it's a fantastic technology um, that allows us to bridge questions that the business stakeholders are having with the data in such a way that, it, that the cycle time from question to answer and to insight is reduced. Tom no longer has to be calling in a, a data science team or a BI team in order to answer the daily questions. You know, Tom, Tom can see those insights himself or the analyst in his team can see those insights herself, themselves and they can even discover new issues that they were not aware of and have weekly meetings, you know, to review the operational friction points in the process. And that's the power that descriptive process mining brings into the equation. We recently conducted um, a study on the opportunities that such descriptive process mining technology brings into organizations via a Delphi study with around 40 experts, the majority from industry, um, rigorously executed. I included the link to the study in here, tinyurl.com slash process mining opportunities with dash in between. And we found that there are basically five major opportunities that descriptive process mining brings into the table uh, for different types of stakeholders in organization, enhancing business transparency, analyzing and comparing different process variants, understanding the impact of exceptions, enhancing compliance, enabling comparison between business processes in different parts of the organization, benchmarking, uh, within the organization, potentially across organizations, and identifying friction points, in particular sources of waste in the process, um, which typically achieved by combining lean with process mining. And there are a number of challenges, of course, that are very well understood, like um, lack of management support, you know, in, in to, to go across all the silos that you need to go in order to implement process mining, particularly for sourcing the data, uh, difficulties in turning those insights into changes, you know, and thus the need to combine process mining with process change methodologies in an agile way, um, data quality issues, high efforts in data preparations, etc. So the typical things 
we will be uh, looking for uh, uh, in the future. And there is a talk tomorrow on data preparation using object-centric process models by uh, one of my colleagues, Will van der, van, Will van der Aals, who will be talking more about those topics. With this technology, you can tackle issues, um, particularly issues related to uh, efficiency, cost performance, compliance, um, a, SLAs, uh, violations, and so on. We have worked with many organizations uh, in terms of helping them to answer questions like the one Tom posted. For example, with a large insurance company in Europe, uh, looking at data from their claims management systems to uh, unveil how, uh, why their claims handling process uh, is violating their 30 days service level agreement, uh, which in some cases uh, uh, needs to be fulfilled by law. Um, and of course, in order to achieve customer satisfaction. Uh, this case study took place right after uh, they had introduced a new claims management systems uh, with the objective to streamline this process and to be able to actually better fulfill their SLA obligations or objectives. And, and they found that it didn't help. Uh, it gave them more visibility into the process to introduce a new claims management system, but they did not manage to reduce the cycle times because of that. Um, and they had a lot of questions. What happened? Uh, did the introduction of new incentives um, caused an issue here? Does it work? Did it work, et cetera? Um, does the new claims management system is able to handle what they call secondary cases in the claims handling, in the claims handling process? Is the training that was provided to liquidators in the context of the introduction of this, this, this new system, is it appropriate? Uh, did it slow them down? Did it speed them up? And, and so on. So they had quite a lot of questions, hypotheses to test, uh, and too little time to address them by means of traditional qualitative analysis and manual process discovery efforts. So they turn out to extracting data from their system and analyzing their liquidation, their uh, claims uh, process in that way. Uh, what they found was, as you have seen in many other case studies in process mining, is a very high level of variability, uh, more close to 2,000 different ways of handling an insurance claim, which is way more than they thought, actually. When they saw that, they said, yeah, but we are sure that there is three or four different pathways that, you know, 80% of the claims take, and, and it was not the case. Even the five most frequent pathways did not uh, cover uh, half of the cases. So, and they had to you know, go up to around 25 different variants to cover uh, around 80% of their cases. So there was quite a long tail in there. Uh, the most uh, frequent pathways uh, accounted for 35% of cases, and then after that, it's a long tail. So it was, very, it was indeed very difficult to approach these kind of questions via qualitative analysis. So what we did is that we combined qualitative analysis with process mining by doing some process mining funnel analysis, we call it, where you kind of look at different phases in the process, in this case, uh, opening, assignment to trustee, assessment, closing of the claim. And for each of those segments in the process, and given the timeline, the ideal timeline that you want to have for each of these phases, trying to identify what are the top issues you know, that we can find by exploring the process with process mining that occur in each of these phases and that are making that we are not passing through this phase in the timeframes that we are expecting to pass, and therefore we are not achieving our objectives. And for each of those phases, we identified a number of issues, um, a number of possible changes that could be applied uh, to address the issues that were identified in that phase. And by following this methodology of funnel analysis combined with a process mining and Six Sigma root cause analysis, we were able to identify a, a, a a dozen of changes that led to 25% uh, reductions in the violations of their SLA 
up to 37% for some uh, of uh, so a specific uh, subset, so, sub process in the process. And uh, that led then to, at the same time, that led to significant cost changes because the process was streamlined and reduced from 1,800 variants to barely a few dozen variants, uh, leading to cost savings in the order of 18 million uh, per year uh, recurrent and improving uh, improved claims handling speed. So that is the power that process mining in combination with traditional BPM methods, uh, Lean, Six Sigma, funnel analysis bring into the equation. What is interesting is what happens afterwards. What is the next step in here? And the next step, most of the times in our experience has been the next step is to go to do it to other processes. But in this particular organization, something very interesting happened, which kind of reshaped the way we have, we now see uh, process mining evolving the future at Promore, which is that the next step was, well, it's great that I am able to see what are the issues in the process and how to streamline it, you know, but I also want my process to be more proactive, to be more agile, to, so that I can see the issues coming and I do not just react to the issues when they arrive. So we worked together with them to implement a technology we now call predictive process monitoring. So which is about creating uh, dash, predictive dashboards that allows you to, uh, to tell to the liquidators in this case, uh, for example, which claims are going to lead to a customer complaint or a customer appeal, or which claims are going to be running late. So that that can be taken into account in the process during, during the performance of the process in order to do resource allocation decisions or in order to preempt uh, issues or delays. Basically, predictive process monitoring is about uh, looking at running cases in the process. So for example, claims that are currently open, for example, in the second day or in the third day. And by using machine learning models built from historical data to predict either outcomes, like is this loan offer going to be accepted or rejected by the customer or predicting performance? Will the claim take more than five days or less than five days to be handled? or predicting future events in the process. So for the purposes of resource allocation, you know, what is going to happen next? What is going to happen after that? What is the most likely path towards completion of the process? The way it works, like more in terms of the how, is we take data from the same enterprise systems from which we take process mining data. In most cases, it's exactly the same Data set in some cases is almost the same with some additional adjust, additional uh, complements to it. And we then run machine learning pipelines in an auto ML styles, fully automated, that produce fine tuned models that then allow you to take an ongoing case and make a prediction for it. And as you stream data from the enterprise system into the predictive monitoring engine, it updates those predictive dashboards uh, so that an, a, a stakeholder can come in the morning at 8.30 in the morning, look at the latest state of the predictive dashboard and make decisions as to what can be do not, done next. I mean, there is a claim here in red, you know, what can we do to avoid uh, this claim violating its SLA. This is a technology that since then we have applied in many contexts invoice recovery processes in a, in a debt collection agency trying to find out which invoices will be paid without going to the bailiff for encashment versus which cases invoices are going to have to be taken to the bailiff so that we can make resource allocation and planning decisions accordingly the claims handling process I just showed to you, or a package delivery process where the objective was that at 8 a.m. every morning, the managers wanted to see in their respective regions 
you know, how many packages will be delivered late of which types, et cetera, and so that they could adjust the, the work of the morning accordingly. So I have spoken until now about descriptive process mining. I take an event log, I generate different types of visualizations, dashboards, process maps, process models, um, enhance it with performance information. I turn it around, I turn around the data to generate insights. And I have spoken about predictive process monitoring, which is taking pretty much the same data, but using it in order to be, build predictive models that allow me to generate predictive dashboards that can be used to enhance decision making at the operational level. One process mining is about tactical management and the other predictive process monitoring is about operational management. As we move forward with these success stories, uh, we found that there is actually a whole lot of other things that you can start building on top of that. One of the questions that came to us was at some point in time was like, it is great to be using process mining to look at the past and to learn from the past. Uh, it is great that I'm going to be able to make at runtime predictions about what's going in the future, but can I also do what if analysis with process mining? Can it also address the question of like, what will happen if I automate these three tasks? Can it also answer the question of what will happen uh, if the number of purchase orders of a certain type increase by 20% next week? And and that took us a little bit further in the journey, in a journey that I now conceptualize as a pyramid. A pyramid which at the bottom starts with descriptive process mining or process mining for short, with the usual capabilities we would expect to see in process mining, automated process discovery, conformance checking, performance mining, and variant analysis. On top of that, which answer questions about how do the process currently look like? And where we are at this moment in, in the evolution of the discipline is moving from this first layer of process mining as a tactical, as is analysis tool to process mining as a tool to predict and to preempt and to do what if analysis. At this layer, the questions we are asking is how will the process look like in the future? Uh, if I don't do any change? How will it look in the future if I do a change? And the technology to address this question is basically an extended version of simulation where we don't build the simulation models by hand as we attempted to do in the late 2000s, early to, in, the, in the early 2000s or in the late 90s, but we actually build the simulation models automatically from the data. So that, and that, that concept is what we usually call a digital process twin or a what if digital process twin. A digital process twin is an artifact we construct from data that allows us to, de to answer the question of what will happen if, if I make a change in the process or if I make what we call an intervention in the process. Is it gonna improve the performance or not? By how much it will improve it? Under what assumptions, under what conditions? Etc. The way this works is that we start from the same data. We start from the same starting point, the same data that we are using to uh, analyze a, a, assist processes using traditional process mining techniques. We put it into a digital twin discovery engine, um, possibly to which possibly we give some uh, additional business rules or domain knowledge optionally, and it produces. A digital twin is essentially a simulation model um, on steroids, uh, much more detailed, much more refined than a traditional simulation model, uh, usually 10 times more complex, but also much more reliable and much more accurate. And then we say, what if I change this? What if I change that? What if I change this? And that goes through a process that I will call change simulation, and it leads you to dashboards that display what will be the performance of the process if you make a change. 
Like for example, if you introduce RPA bots to automate four of the 40 tasks in your process, or what if uh, the number of claims increases by 10% uh, next month, et cetera. That's those two technologies, predictive process monitoring and digital process twins constitute the second layer of this augmented business process management pyramid. The same Tom and other stakeholders in this insurance company I mentioned before are now asking the following questions. So it is great that we can see, uh, you know, we can look at our process from the perspective of the ASIS process, that we can analyze it, that we can predict when, you know, something will go wrong in a case or what if I do something. What, I'm, what, what they say they are missing is something that tells them not only that something is going to go wrong, but also what is the most effective way of fixing it given past information. And that is what we call prescriptive process monitoring. It's an engine that not only predicts, but it also, based on past information, can prescribe what is the best action among several possible actions to address a particular predicted performance issue. Prescriptive process monitoring basically uh, starts from the same data as before, the event logs of what has happened in the past. It builds a variant of a predictive model. They are not called predictive models. They are called causal models uh, because they do not only predict, but identify also the causes why something will go wrong. And then it takes an ongoing case in the process and you will put it through that predictive model and it tells us, a, it, it spits out like a recommendation, you know, do this or do that. For example, it will tell you that in a, in a, partic a particular case is going to go uh, wrong. You know, it's going to violate the SLA. Um, and for example, uh, if you uh, reallocate it to another case handler, uh, then the probability that that case will not be late is um, in, improved by 10%. Uh, or um, if that a product is going to be returned with a probability of 30%, but that if you offer a replacement to that customer from this category of products, the probability that there will be a product return will reduce from 20% to 10%. So, Prescriptive process monitoring talks about the differentials in the probability of a negative outcome if you do something and if you don't do. And it's based, it's not science fiction, it's based on proven technology, the same type of technology that is used by recommender systems in the field of e-commerce, or for example, if you go to booking.com, you know, it recommends you, well, maybe you want that hotel. Why? Because if you go to that hotel, your probability of being satisfied is 10% higher than if you go to this hotel, for example. Uh, so it's based on the same technology that Uber, that Facebook, et cetera, that the internet giants are using on the B2C side, just brought into the business process world. And these recommendations that are generated by this system are routed them to process workers uh, taking into account the cost of these interventions, taking into account uh, the, the benefit of in these interventions, so prioritized according to their benefit, so that the process workers can apply those recommendations and then feed that information back into the system so that the system continuously improves its recommendations, just as recommender systems would do in the field of business to consumer e-commerce. This is what we call prescriptive process monitoring. It goes beyond predictive process monitoring in that it's looking at causal relations to tell you, to recommend you how to avoid negative outcomes in your process. It's, a, it's an operational management technology that you use on a day-to-day -day basis to drive the performance of the process on the fly. The 
the counterpart of prescriptive process monitoring as a tactical management tool, as like a tool that the analyst of the process owner uses, is what we call automated process improvement. And it belongs to the third layer of the pyramid as well. Automated process improvement is a technology in the making. So we, we are just seeing prototypes of it coming out that will take the same data that I mentioned before, the data that you use for process mining, possibly with some additional enhancements. And it's able to tell you, for example, that for certain subsets of cases, very fine grain, in this case, consumer loans, if you do these tasks, check income sources before check her credit history, then the probability that you fulfill your SLA increases by 10%. So it's recommending you to change the process for a particular set of cases, to change the business rules. Let me give you some further examples to, to illustrate what it tells you. It tells you, for example, that for if the customer has previous loans in the bank, then this task is usually skipped. So probably that's what we should change the process to make this explicit. If the credit rating is C or D, then uh, there is no point in waiting for an appeal because we will reject the appeal, for example. Or if we allocate, we have, instead of, if we allocated more resources on Monday and Tuesday to the check credit history task, and we allocated more resources on Thursday and Friday to the credit offer task, it will increase our probability. It will increase uh, the, it, it, the performance of the process from a temporal perspective. Or for example, it can recommend you that certain tasks uh, could be automated, and if they are automated, they will improve the cycle times of the process by 10% or 20% and reduce our SLA violation rate from um, a 5% to 3%, for example. That is the third layer of the pyramid, prescriptive process monitoring, automated process improvement. Finally, the fourth layer of the pyramid, which does not exist yet, but is where we are seeing the next evolution happening, is moving beyond the machine, the process mining engine, you know, telling you something like, oh, there is a problem here, there is a problem here, you could do this, you could do that, you could do this, to having an interactive conversation with the process mining engine or with the augmented BPM engine, as we call it, in order, so I call that conversational process optimization, so that starting with a question like the one Tom posed to us five years ago, what, uh, uh, how do I reduce the uh, SLA violations by 10%? The process engine can find, the augmented BPM engine can find what are the options for achieving that objective, both at design time, what, how can we change the process in that direction, but also at runtime, you know, prescribing recommendations at runtime for specific cases based on their individual characteristics in order to reduce, to achieve the objective of reducing the SLA violations by 10% while maintaining the current cost efficiency of the process. And that goes basically in the direction of having processes that are able to execute a certain, uh, within their current environment, but that then are able to trigger or propose adaptations in order to achieve certain objectives that they have been given uh, by the process owners. This pyramid I show you um, is work in progress. The first level is premature technology, that's process mining. The second layer, predictive process monitoring and what if digital twins is technology that is ripe for adoption and that has already been proven by early adopters or tested by early adopters. Prescriptive process monitoring and is a technology that is being tested uh, by some very, very early adopters, as well as automated process improvement. And the upper layer of the pyramid is what I will expect to see happening in 2023 to 2025, given the current trends. This is very exciting because it means all the effort we are doing to set up process mining initiatives, all the effort we are doing to extract the data 
is going to pay off for years to come at different levels, not only in terms of the current capabilities, but in terms of the capabilities it will enable in the future. So my recommendation to climb the BPM pyramid is to lay the foundations first, get your process mining initiative right, start climbing early, steadily, don't hold off, get the data out, because the benefits that you will get from getting the data out for process mining are going to pay off as you move into the upper layers. Don't skip the layers. Don't try to do predictive monitoring if you have not done process mining. Don't try to even dare to do prescriptive monitoring if you have not done predictive monitoring. So you need to make sure that you can predict before you can start following recommendations on the basis of effectively predictions. And then, of course, along the way, align the initiative strategically and build governance incrementally. Apply the capabilities in the pyramid first and foremost to the business processes that matter to the organization and, uh, and build success stories along the way. So that is my main message. The augmented BPM pyramid is here. Many organizations have already started climbing it, def definitely in the first layer and quite a few already in the second layer and expect to see more coming in the future. Uh, my poll is related to that. Uh, are you already implementing or planning to implement predictive process monitoring? And I don't give you the option no, but I give you the option not yet. And I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Marlon. Um, we have questions indeed. Um, someone's asking if they could get the slides, uh, and I think I think they could reach out to you directly for, for that, do you think? Uh, I can take the questions myself. I'm seeing them. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. Janik uh, asks, uh, for predictive process monitoring, for example, in the insurance claims example, how do we evaluate the model performance? Um, particularly if we are working already with cases that are at risk and therefore changing, uh, that the outcome keeps changing. So. Uh, the way we evaluate the performance is typically by means of, a cost, uh, of, a, of graphs that show at different points in time on, on, on a subset of the data, on a training holdout of data, at different points in time during the performance of the process. You know, the claim into six hours into the claim, 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, etc., all throughout. Then we look at different metrics like you know that could be your accuracy your f score your auc etc and also we start looking at feature importance we call it at different levels you know what determines that certain claims are at risk at six 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 hours into the claim being made 12 hours into it 24 hours into it etc so effectively the existing methodologies for assessing the uh, pre uh, predictive models, but taking into account the, predict the, the, the temporal nature of the process, and in some cases, as you say, separating between different types of cases, in this case, different types of claim. I hope that kind of address at least some of the question. Um, uh, Jan Riken asked two questions. Can I promote already today predict running process instances in the process stream? Uh, yes, it can read from a Kafka stream and generate the predictive dashboards on the fly. So every time a new event arrives, then it reevaluates that case and it generates a new probability of going late. And then it, it updates the dashboard as it goes. And how is prescriptive monitoring works in Apromore? Um, prescriptive process monitoring uh, does not yet work in Apromore. Um, I am very honest about it because I also have an academic hat, so I have a reputation to maintain. Um, a promoter still is only using predictions. It's not predictive scores. It can trigger notifications if a predictive score goes above 90% 90, 90 of violating the SLA, uh, but it's not yet using causal inference techniques uh, to uh, take into account potential confounding factors, as, you know, to, to identify true causal relations uh, a, a, in order to be able to make a recommendation. Um, 
a Miriam Lutrin asks, can we get the presentation recording? I guess definitely yes. Kamran, uh, it will be, there will be a follow-up on that. Uh, Kamran asks, sounds like machine learning is being used for the prescriptive and augmented layers. If so, what kind of in-house talent is required to manage and maintain these tools? Um, my answer as a vendor is, of course, that you need my tool, right, for sure. Um, a, a, my second answer is that tools already incorporate quite a lot of automation into them in terms of like that reduce the need for the data, the, the data scientists to step in. Uh, three is you do need uh, a data science with a machine learning expertise if you uh, are going to deploy this into production. You need to have people or at least someone who has a good understanding of what the machine behind is doing and not just consume it blindly. So, but that could be in-house, but that could also be contracted. That basically depends on your procurement policies in a way. Um, eh, so usually that can be bought also uh, as part of your uh, contract for your predictive monitoring engine. Uh, do you have an assessment model to determine at which level of the pyramid a business is? No, I don't. I, 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 I definitely should. Um, there should be some criteria about, like, are you, for what purpose are you using the data, the process mining? Are you using it to inform uh, decisions in combination with other qualitative or quantitative techniques? Are you using it in order to make predictions, etc.? cetera? Um, William, that's, that's a very interesting question that very unfortunately, I don't have an answer out of my box, but it should be developed. Um, Simon asks, would you be thinking each layer of the pyramid, the success factors and organizational capabilities are, are the same? You are very right. Uh, predictive process monitoring and prescriptive process monitoring don't make sense if you do not deploy them together with uh, capabilities to absorb the output of these engines. We had, unfortunately, that case ourselves. We committed the scene of developing predictive dashboards for a couple of customers in a couple of occasions that were never used, not because the dashboards were not technically there, they were there, they, the models were fairly good, the predictions were fairly good, but we failed perhaps to accompany the customer in terms of developing the capability to use the predictions in order to trigger actions that will improve the, the process. And, and, and that, is, that means predictive monitoring needs to come with a capability that you have to change your process from workers being reactive to workers being proactive and you know, looking at the predictive dashboard and having instructions on what to do when certain cases are running late, when only a handful are running late, where several are running late, Etc. and how to prioritize accordingly. Uh, Lior asks, where can we find more information about ABPMS? I think that you just type augmented BPM on Google and you will find some very good resources. Uh, a, it's, it's, very, it's a very nice, it's, it's a discipline that is just merging. So uh, frankly, that's the best recommendation I can give. Um, how process mining works in an ITSM environment for capacity, availability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a, and demand management. These are major challenges going to ITSM. Prediction and forecast become valid. Ah, wow. Another question that is too good. And I am not able to give an answer out of my head. Uh, I can... I can see indeed there is an underexplored area. Uh, I have not been, been involved in projects on developing predictive monitoring capabilities in ITSM setting, but indeed, uh, you know, there are the questions are very relevant. You know, what if uh, I get 10% more incidents uh, of this type next week? 
uh, what if uh, a, um, I uh, deploy more resources into a certain area or to handle certain types of tickets or incidents? Um, wow, we, we need to do some, we, we need to, I, I, I just don't have a pilot in that area on, on the predictive monitoring, but it is indeed an area where there is tremendous applications coming in. Uh, and I think uh, if I can take one more, Anna, or rather we'll move to the poll. Uh, we should wrap up now, but yes, please feel free to, to have one okay. more question. What will be the best process mining software that could be deployed in the minimum effort to at least get started and build a case for future effort with more resources? Uh, oh, well, of course, that is a from Warren. So what a nice way of finishing the talk. Uh, please, Anna, go for it. Uh, I, I, I'm sure we, uh, we are a little bit too late to continue. Uh, thanks, Marlon. So before we finish the session, would you like to comment on the poll results? I, I cannot see them. All right, ah, I need to yet. speak on it. Oh, yeah, now I can see them. Oh, wow. Um, a, it's amazing because I was saying there will be two thirds of not, not, not yet there, and it's two thirds of not yet there. That is matching the impression, uh, and uh, uh, I see much more perhaps predictive monitoring than I was expecting there to be. But that is just very encouraging. Right. Thank you very much, Marlon. And uh, I would like to remind our viewers that the next session, final session of the day, will start in 15 minutes' time. So I hope to see you there. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye and thank you, everybody.